I'll do in this video is cover the third context point of the maintaining balance module. There's 16 dot points. So what I'll do in a second is I'll talk about the verbs of each of the dot points, connect the verbs to content. So basically then you know what you need to know for each of those dot points. There's four sections. So you can see sections here. And you can jump to any of those sections if you want to, or just uh, let me go for them one by one. But I'll start with the first one. First one I'll cover is 3.1, which says explain, which means show why the concentration of water in cells should be maintained within a narrow range for optimal function. If we have an isotonic solution, which is that narrow range, so we have exactly as much solute inside as outside, that means water will flow in and out at the same rate, which means overall the cell is going to have perfect amounts of water, narrow limits, and it's going to work properly. Compared to, for example, hypotonic solution, hypo means low, so you are going to have low solute outside compared to inside. And remember, osmosis is the movement of water from an area of low solid to high solid. So in this case, water would travel in the cell because of that. That would cause the cell to burst. Obviously, that's not a normal function. In the other case, we have a hypotonic solution. Hyper means high, so we've got more actual salt in solution than inside. In this case, low solid to high solid, water travels out the cell because of osmosis. And that would cause the cell to shrivel up. So both of those cases are not ideal, which is why we want to maintain it in an isotonic solution for the cell to function properly. Next one was I explain, which means show why the removal of waste is essential for continued metabolic activity. And in this case, we have carbon dioxide being one of the wastes. If we produce too much carbon dioxide for cellular respiration, what that does is it lowers the pH that will denature enzymes. And remember, metabolic activity is how good enzymes work. So if the enzymes become denatured, that means we, ha we the enzymes work less effectively. And that's why we have to remove carbon dioxide. Another one is urea. And when urea builds up, what that will cause is this, it will cause a cell to burst. The reason why is because urea is a solute. So remember, if we have lots of solute in our actual cell, what that's going to mean, it's going to have more solute inside than outside. So water will travel from the in outside to the inside, which will cause the cell to burst. Obviously, if it bursts, that's not ideal for normal function either. Next one is 3.3. It says identify, which means name recognize the role of the kidney in the excretory system of fish and mammals. They both have the kidney for both fish and mammals, but they have different roles. In mammals, it will remove nitrogenous waste in the form of urea, and it will also do osmoregulation, which means it will regulate the amount of water and salt. Whereas fish only does osmoregulation, it will only regulate water and salt levels because ammonia can be removed through the gills itself, so it doesn't have to balance nitrogenous waste. Next is 3.11, that means comp it says compare, which means show how the urine concentration of terrestrial mammals, marine fish, and freshwater fish are different and are similar. And also, we have to explain. Um, which means in this case, show why the, these levels are different. So for example, we've got the freshwater fish, which produces large amounts of dilute urine, whereas a marine fish produces small amounts of concentrated urine. So now we've, com we've compared, what we have to do next is actually explain why. So the reason why the freshwater fish produce large amounts of dilute urine is because they live in a hypotonic solution. Hypotonic solution means that we have more solute inside than outside, which means water will travel into the fish. So if there's nothing that happens, this fish will basically have too much water inside of it, which will cause it to burst. But it produces dilute urine to get rid of that extra water to make sure nothing happens, nothing bad happens. And it rarely drinks as well. That's all you need to know. It rarely drinks to make sure it doesn't get any extra water. So it has too much water. Whereas the marine fish, it lives in a hypotonic solution. That means it has more salt in the outside than the inside. So water will travel from low solute to high solute. So the water will actually travel out of the fish which will mean it will, would usually it would shrivel up if nothing happens. But the reason why it produces concentrate urine is to conserve water, to make sure it doesn't shrivel up. And that's why it maintains its normal function. And also one more adaption is that it constantly drinks as opposed to the freshwater fish that rarely drinks. Right, so now we've explained, because we, they live in different types of solutions, that's why there's a difference in the concentration. The terrestrial mammal you can produce either concentrated or dilute urine, depending on what kind of environment it lives in. Right, If you have lots of water, you're going to produce dilute. If you have little water, you're going to produce concentrated. Mostly we have concentrated urine. Most mammals produce concentrated urine because we often have, we're lacking, we're lacking water in most cases. All right, so in this case, we have the next one is explain, which means in this case, show the relationship between the conservation of water and the production and excretion of concentrated nitrogenous waste in a range of Australian insects and mammals. So if we compare Australian insects, and I've chosen a grass skipper butterfly and the hedge grasshopper, and if we compare that to mammals, the spinifex hopping mouse and the red kangaroo. And what we have to do is we have to look about look at the conservation of water and how it's linked to the type of nitrogenous waste that they remove. So for example, the actual two insects, what they do is they produce uric acid because they don't drink at all. They very they don't drink at all. They get their water only from the food that they eat. 
which means they have very little water in their diet. So they need to be able to conserve water. And the best way to conserve water is to produce uric acid. And that uric acid, they can just deposit on the outside of their, um, either their actual wings or there's their skeleton, which means they don't need to actually urinate because they don't, they can just deposit on the, on the actual outside. So it's saving water because they don't have to urinate. Whereas the actual mammals, they live in a dry environment, but they have a bit more water because they can drink water, so they have a bit more water than the insects, which means they can produce urea. The good thing about urea is it can be stored for a while as opposed to ammonia, which would be have to be removed in a second. So they can, they can actually store that ammonia and that urea for a while, which means they will lose some water when they urinate but not as much as they would with ammonia. So that's why they produce ammonia as opposed to urea. That's uh, why they produce urea as opposed to ammonia. But you should just know that urea is for mammals and uric acid is for insects, and the reason why as well. The first one says identify, which means name recognize the regions involved in the excretion of waste products. And it's a actual experiment you did. So it says perform a skill verb. So you need to know the procedure of that experiment, the dissection, and also safety precautions as well. But I'll talk about the actual parts that are involved in excretion. So we've got the cortex and the medulla. The cortex is this part here. The medulla are these pyramids. And the medulla is involved when it comes to the removal of the urine for the collecting ducts, because the collecting ducts are part of the medulla. And the actual cortex is where the proximal, distal tubule, and the glomerulus is. So that's where we have all of the actual reabsorption and removal of urea, or putting urea into the nephron itself that occurs. The renal pelvis is part here. And the renal pelvis is where all of these collecting ducts will join together to, to remove that urine. And then the ureta is that pipe where it will travel, the urine will travel down towards the bladder. And obviously at the bladder, we then have it removed through the um, penis or vagina. So in this case, that's what you need to know for these four structures and where they are in the kidney. Next one is explain, which means show why the process of diffusion and osmosis are inadequate in removing the dissolved nitrogenous waste in some organisms. Right, so diffusion is not good enough because diffusion is not fast enough. Right? We need to remove all of the urea and it's a very small, fine area, which means diffusion itself wouldn't, just, wouldn't, wouldn't do that fast enough. And osmosis isn't good enough because it only deals with water and not with urea. So we can remove water, but we can't remove urea through osmosis. So we need to have different types of processes and filtration will be one of, the, one of them. I right, have next one, it says distinguish between, which means recognize the difference between active and passive transport and relate, which means show where these processes occur in the mammalian kidney. So we'll talk about the difference between those two first. So we need to know passive requires no energy, which means active requires energy. And you also need to know examples of the ones that occur in the kidney. For example, diffusion, that's when something goes from high concentration to low concentration. Osmosis, when water travels from, high, from low to high solid concentration, um, and it goes through a, a membrane, a semi-permeable membrane. Filtration is at high pressure that basically filters a lot of things from that go into our, in this case, nephron. And active transport is when we have something moving from low concentration to high concentration with the use of energy. But you also need to know where they occur. Now we have diffusion and osmosis that basically occur at different parts. So those two combined happen at all over the actual nephron. Osmosis especially happens at the proximal distal tubule, the lower part of the Henle, uh, loop Henle, and the collecting duct. Filtration occurs on the glomerulus, and we have active transport that occurs on the distal tubule, the proximal tubule, the collecting duct, and the ascending loop Henle. So that's where, where we have active transport occurs, the ones in pink, and the other ones are the ones which are passive, which occurs all over the kidney. The next one is explain how, which means show how the process of filtration and reabsorption in the mammalian kidney or nephron regulate body fluid composition. So how do they make sure we can have all of the waters and salt balanced, and how do we remove our urea using those processes. Our filtration is a high speed pressure, which basically squeezes out all the urea from our blood. So that's how we can filter out the urea from our blood, how we can change the composition in that way. Reabsorption is the idea of making sure that all that glucose and all the amino acids, which were also filtered by mistake, are reabsorbed back into our body from the filtrate. So filtrate is the part of the action nephron, and it goes back into our blood through this reabsorption, that's good because we want to keep amino acid and glucose. And also water will, and salt are also reabsorbed, and that means we can balance water levels. And that occurs basically at, at all different parts of the body. But reabsorption just means if something leaves the actual nephron and goes back into our body, that's what reabsorption is. But those both of mechanisms allow us to balance water and salt levels and remove urea as well. The next, last one was outline, which means sketch in general terms, the role of the antidiuretic hormone in water um, regulation. So in this case, we have, when we are low on water, that's when we're going to produce that hormone ADH. 
And what it's going to do, the hormone ADH is going to move towards our collecting duct. Remember, this is our collecting duct, it's part of our nephron. And what it's going to do, it's going to make the walls more permeable to water loss. Permeable means you can almost imagine it's going to be tiny holes that go into that collecting duct wall. The reason why that's important is because our body, which is going to be surrounding the collecting duct, basically our body tissue, has a higher concentration of solute in the, in the body than in the collecting duct, which means usually water will want to leave the collecting duct and go into our body. But because the wall prevents it from happening, usually this doesn't happen. But when the ADH opens those walls, that means water can leave, from go from low solute to high solute, and go back into our body, which means we conserve water. Right? So as opposed to that, that water being lost in our urine, it's going to be moving back in the body and we conserve water. So ADH is then produced when we are wanting to conserve water, and it will do that process. The next one is this, 3.9. It says outline, which means sketch in general terms, the role of aldosterone in the regulation of water and salt levels in the blood. So what aldosterone do does, it's released when salt levels are low. And when salt levels are low, that also means blood volume is low, because when salt levels are low, we lose water as well, and water is connected to blood volume. So when we have low salt levels or low salt or blood volume, we have um, aldosterone being released. And what it does, it acts on the distal tubule and the collecting duct. This is the distal tubule, and this is the collecting duct. And what it does, it just basically makes us reabsorb more salt. And when we reabsorb absor more salt, that means water follows, because water always follows salt. And what that does, it increases our blood volume and also increases our blood pressure. So that's basically the function of aldosterone. And the next one is outline, which means sketch in general terms, the use of hormone replacement therapy in people who cannot secrete aldosterone. So people who cannot secrete aldosterone are, for example, people who have Addison's disease because they have a adrenal cortex that doesn't work properly, and that's meant to be releasing aldosterone. So if they have that, that means they don't produce aldosterone. So instead, we give them a medication. This is the replacement therapy, this medication we give them. An example of that would be fluorocortisones. You should know that name or that, that medication. And what it does is it has the same function as aldosterone. So if we give people fluorocortisones, it will reabsorb more salt. And when more salt is reabsorbed, more water is reabsorbed. That means we increase our blood volume and blood pressure. But the only negative would be that you can't finally control that because we, if you overdose on the medica medication, there's no way to stop the medication from acting, whereas aldosterone is finely balanced. So that's the only negative. But it uh, does the same function as aldosterone. We just got to have it more finely balanced. The next one is a compare, which means show how the process of renal dialysis is different or similar to the function of the kidney. So here we have to compare kidneys to renal dialysis. Renal dialysis is used for people who have kidney failure, so their kidneys don't work anymore, but they still need to remove special urea. Right? So we need to compare how the, these processes are similar or different. For example, function, there are some similar similarities. They both remove urea. That's one of the main functions. And then the kidney does osmoregulation, which means it regulates salt and water levels to very fine balance, whereas the renal dialysis only removes extra water, it doesn't finely balance salt, so that's one of the differences. In terms of what kind of hormones act in kidney, we've got the ADH and aldosterone, these make sure that our water and salt levels are finely balanced, whereas we have no hormones at all acting in renal dialysis. The type of processes that are responsible for all of the ones I mentioned earlier, the, the, their functions, we've got active and passive transport in the kidney, so we've got active transport, we've got diffusion, osmosis, and filtration in the kidney, whereas we only have osmosis and a bit of diffusion happening in renal dialysis. Because we don't have filtration, it means we, it takes a lot longer in the renal dialysis. So speed, the kidneys are really fast, because of, especially because of filtration, whereas the renal dialysis is quite slow. It takes about three to four hours for it to happen in terms of cleaning up blood. And when it happens, well, it al the kidneys always work, whereas the renal dialysis, you only do it two to three times a week when you actually go to hospital and get hooked up like that. But these were some similarities and differences between the two of the processes, kidneys and the renal dialysis. I covered 3.13 first. It says define, which means state the meaning of, and antistasis as the maintenance of metabolic and physiological function in response to variation in the environment. I would recommend you, you basically memorize that definition. But what that means is people, uh, organisms do homeostasis. What they will do is they will maintain their salt concentrations at a very fine limit to make sure they can survive um, generally, whereas animals are doing antistasis, what they do is during low tides, for example, when salt levels are really low, they're going to have low salt levels inside of them, whereas if it's high tide, they're going to have really high salt levels. So there's going to be big fluctuations in the salt levels, 
they have different kind of mechanisms that can balance or can make up for that change in their internal environment to make sure that their physiological, which means their body, and their metabolic, which means their enzymes, still work. Right? So enantiostasis is a bit different to homeostasis, but basically enantiostasis is really important for animals to, in the estuarine environment. The second part that Dot points says discuss, which means identify and provide points for and or against, is important in estuarine organisms in maintaining appropriate soil concentrations. So estuarine organisms are organisms that live in a place which is close to a ocean and freshwater. So basically, for example, during high tide, you would have the, it would, the animal here would be in the ocean. During low tide, it would be in the freshwater. So the salt fluctuations are big in terms of on a daily basis. And that means these animals need to have homeostasis would not be good enough to be able to deal with that. They need to have other mechanisms to be able to compensate. And that's where enantiostasis comes into play. And without enantiostasis, they would not be able to survive because they can't have normal function because their body would fail on them. Right? The next one is this one, 3.14, discuss, which means in this case identify processes and provide points for and or against its use for different plants for their salt regulation in saline environments. Saline environments just means that they live in very salty environments. And the example of that plant would be the mangrove tree. And these are three different types of mangrove trees and they all have different types of mechanisms to be able to survive salty environments. The reason why is it says identify processes and the reasons why provide for arguments for or against reason why these have to have these processes is if the salt concentrations are too high, that means in this case these plants die because they can't do an antistasis, so they need to get rid of the extra salt. And what they can do is they can, they can either have roots that block the salt, so in this case you can see the salt just can't get in because these mangrove trees have um, roots that block the salt. In this case you have leaves that accumulate, so this mangrove tree will allow salt to come in, that extra salt, and then it will accumulate in one leaf. When that leaf is full of salt, it will drop it into the water and it will have lost all the extra salt. And the other one was if you have, in this case, you have an extra salt that comes in, but it actually goes to a leaf and that leaf has glands, so it's called, they're called the salt glands. And what they do is they just eject, they remove all the extra salt, they basically just shoot it back out again. On all of these mechanisms to make sure that the salt concentrations inside of it are relatively stable. And they need to have that for normal function. Next one was described, which means provide features and characteristics of adaptations of a range of terrestrial plants that assist in the minimizing of water loss. So we're going to talk about the eucalyptus and the spinifex because you need to have at least two different types of plants and to talk about how they conserve water. Transpiration is just the water loss, so evaporation of water, and they have narrow leaves because narrow leaves means less surface area. So if you have less surface area, you have less transpiration. That's how one way they can conserve water. They also have these waxy cuticles on the leaves. The waxy cuticles are just a layer of fat. A layer of fat basically doesn't allow water to penetrate, so water can't go through fat, which means there's less water loss, there's less transpiration. That's another mechanism that they have. And then they also have these vertically hanging leaves. Remember that was just the idea of them being hanging downwards, which means the sun doesn't hit the whole leaf, which means there's less parts that are exposed to the sun and there's less transpiration, which means there's more water conservation. So these are three mechanisms that the plant does. You need to be able to describe them because Dot Point says so. The next one is the spinifex grass. Spinifex grass is this one here. And what it can do when it's really, really dry is it can roll up its actual um, its actual grass, the, the actual leaves. So you can see it can roll it up. And that means any water droplets that are on the inside will be safe from the, will be spared from the sun. The sun doesn't get there, which means the it just saves some transpiration from happening, which means it saves some water as well. So these leaves that curl up is one mechanism that spinifex grass does to conserve water. And the last one was 3.16, which says gather, so collect information about the structures that assist in the conservation of water. And perform is a skill verb, which means you need to know the procedure and also safety precautions for the experiment. But the experiment was quite similar, uh, quite simple. You simply looked at this different type of Australian plants. You might have been given uh, in a lab, you might have looked at them under the microscope, or you might simply have observed them in terms of your naked eye, and you try to find these different types of structures that you might have talked about in class, or you, or we talked about just now, and to see them with your eye and, and how they might help with conserving water. But know the procedure you did, and also know the safety precautions as well. But this was a quick summary of the third context point of the Maintaining Balance module. I hope that was useful.